Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our look at uh, cables. Uh, we will be looking at how to apply our general uh, cable equation that we saw last time that relates the horizontal thrust in a cable to the cable drape and the equivalent uh, simple span bending moment for an equivalent beam. Uh, then we'll be looking at catenary curves and also exploring some general properties of both uh, cable drape uh, cable and cable tension, as well as some of the properties of catenary curves. Okay, so um, I think we'll start again today. We're finishing up on cables. So the topic for today, uh, again, is cables. And I want to start by summing up uh, or summarizing the key general uh, form we saw last week, the key general piece of information we saw last week. Uh, so the general form of what we saw at the end of class last time is the following equation. Um, according to the variables at least used in the course text, we have uh, mz. We're going to have mz equals h times hz. So we have mz equals capital H times hz. And let's go ahead and define each of these. So we have, um, let's see, uh, mz, again, is the equivalent, uh, is going to be our um, equivalent simple span bending moment. Our equivalent uh, simple span bending moment. Uh, H, capital H, is our horizontal thrust at a certain location. It is not the tension in the cable, but it is the horizontal component of the tension in the cable. And uh, HC is the cable drape. And we also discussed last time that that is the distance, uh, the vertical distance uh, from the uh, points on the beam, or sorry, on the cable, um, from point on cable to the straight line between ends. Uh, straight line between ends. And I know that's a very cumbersome way of uh, phrasing that, but um, it really is basically the cable drape, but we just have to define it in a very careful way. If we have a cable that begins and ends at the same elevation, then we're not deal then it's not too difficult. It's simply if we have a cable that is uh, starting and ending uh, at the same elevation, then at any point HZ is simply the distance to a horizontal line like this. However, if you have a cable that is hanging from two points and is carrying load that is hanging from two points of different elevation, they hang something like this, and in that case the cable drape is measured from a diagonal line, um, and you'll need to calculate the equation of that line and, and do a little trigonometry perhaps to find that hz for a given location. Also of note, um, let's say we have, so, so that's one note on hz, our uh, cable drape. Then um, another note on our horizontal thrust. So as long as uh, we don't have any horizontal loads on a cable, as long as a cable is carrying only vertical loads, that horizontal thrust should be constant throughout the entire cable. And how do I know that? Well, imagine I have a cable like so, and I cut it at the center. Say I cut it at the center here. Um, 
And then I isolate this portion of the cable, kind of doing a method of sections analysis. If I isolate that, I would have a, on this cable, actually let me maybe redraw the cable in purple here. Kind of like that. So if I cut it here, um, I would reveal a horizontal thrust H, but by static, by static equilibrium, I should also have an H here the same horizontal thrust at the uh, left support of that cable. Then in turn, imagine I were to also cut, um, let's say another section, maybe right here. Well, that horizontal thrust on the support still exists. It's just not, now we're just not going all the way to the mid-span of the cable. So you, by, so you would still have this horizontal thrust H on the left hand side and then you would of course for static equilibrium you would have to have the same h at this point here so in other words the horizontal thrust in a cable is going to be constant no matter where you cut it as long as that uh again as long as there are only vertical loads on the on the cable if there were any horizontal loads on the cable, uh, which uh, I suppose could happen in some weird circumstances, but in most cases, they're only gonna be carrying vertical loads. And so if you have any kind, uh, so as long as you, again, because if you added a horizontal load here, for example, then you would not have the case of H simply equaling H, you'd have to apply other, other bits of uh, static equilibrium. So we have a, again, we have a constant horizontal thrust H throughout the cable. Now, horizontal thrust, again, is not the same thing as cable tension. Um, now, the, it is sometimes the same. Um, in fact, let me go ahead, let's, let, let's look at that. Let's look at locations within cables and the relationship between thrust and cable tension. Let's take a look at that. Very graceful. All right, so uh, next let's consider our, uh, the relationship between horizontal thrust and cable tension. So again, let's consider a simple cable that is being supported at two endpoints of equal elevation. So we have a cable like this. Now, um, the key thing to keep in mind with cables is that, again, if we think back to our definition of a cable, a cable can only carry tensile forces. It cannot carry shear, it cannot carry moment, it cannot carry compression. You can't push a rope, and uh, in our simple model here, we're saying that a, uh, a cable rope, etc., cannot carry uh, any shear moment as well as compression. So what that means is that the only force at any location in a cable should be tensile force, and because of that, because okay, if we have a, if we cut out a piece of the cable, and look at it, at any given point the tension is going to align directly with the axis at that given location. Or in other words, that if you uh, consider the direction of the tension vector all the way along the uh, cable, for example, here the tension is aligned like this, here it's aligned like this, here it's aligned like this, etc. In other words, at any point, the tension uh, is going to be uh, tangent to the curve of the cable. 
So the the uh, tension is tangent to the uh, to the cur to the cable's curve itself. Uh, to curve of the cable. And so that means we can we can find something about we can determine something about the tension in a cable um, just by looking at the geometry of the cable itself. So let's consider what happens if we look at uh, two different points here, one down at vent span and maybe two way up here near the support. So let's draw some uh, simplified free body diagrams here, or let's look at the internal forces, the internal forces at each of these. So if I look at uh, the cable down at one, I'm gonna look just at the right-hand side of this and ignore the left-hand side for now. But, so we will have our horizontal thrust here when I cut it at one. Now, um, again, here the, hor the, the cable itself is horizontal and the horizontal component of, and the horizontal thrust is of course horizontal. So here at one, the cable and horizontal thrust are aligned. Or in other words, the tension force is exactly equal to our horizontal uh, cable force, or our horizontal thrust in the cable. Now, what if you were to look at point two? So consider point two where the cable, where the vector of the cable is more like this. The tangent line of the cable is more like this. 60 degrees, 45 degrees, whatever it might be. So you have your overall tension vector. Your overall tension vector still needs to be, some, is gonna need to be something like this because it is parallel with the cable, but our horizontal thrust still needs to be the same magnitude, H which means the only way this can be this can happen is if the tension here is not equal to the horizontal thrust and in fact it's somewhat greater than the horizontal thrust or in other words uh, because and because again the horizontal thrust must remain constant throughout the length of the cable um, that means that and and the steeper the cable you need more and more tension force to produce the same amount of horizontal thrust so therefore, a steeper cable must equal a higher overall tension force. Because again, whatever angle the uh, at whatever angle the cable is at, or and in turn whatever angle the tensile for the tension force is at, whatever angle the tension force is at, uh, the horizontal component of that tension force must be equal to the cable thrust. So if you have a very steep cable at some location, say at the, if you have a very steep cable uh, near the support, then the tension is going to be very high there. So if you, if you have a, a cable that is a simple, a simply drooped cable like this, um, if you want to know where the maximum tension is, you simply look where the slope is steepest. Again, because they're going to, and we know this because uh, a, t a cable will carry only tensile forces, and that tensile force must always be parallel to the cable's own direction at any given location. And so, I be, and because of that, then I, I then know that here, that at this location, the tension vector has to be pointing like this, at here it has to be pointing like this, and at here it has to be pointing like this. At any location, the direction of the tension vector has to be aligned with the cable itself. And um, because the horizontal thrust has to be constant by static equilibrium, the only way that can be true with a cheaper, with a, not a cheaper, a steeper cable angle is if the uh, tensile force is higher um, in, at a steeper location. Hopefully that makes sense. Questions on that princi basic um, principle of cables. Okay, so I thought we might look at a uh, relatively simple, well, just a, a relatively simple example. So let's consider something. And I'm gonna look at a um, small suspension bridge example. I 
actually, we might look at something a little, even a little simpler first. I don't know. I think we'll look at the suspension bridge. Okay. So let's say we have a suspension bridge. And let's say we have something like this. Uh, we have a few towers or supports of some sort. So we're going to have a couple towers. And let's say they are 100 feet apart. And this is probably way too short a span for it to, to really make a suspension bridge worthwhile, but we're going for style points and we decided to install a suspension bridge. And so let's say the distance between the supports is 100 feet and the cable is drooping down like this, the primary cable. And then um, I will say that, um, let's see, I will get, let's say all this is given. And then let's also say that we have designed this, uh, that it will have a parabolic shape. So that is a given in this problem. And then let's say there is a road deck being supported by the, our primary cable um, through some secondary cables like so. And let's say that this uh, induces a average loading of uh, two kips per foot. So on the road deck, well, everything on the road deck, including the, the road deck itself, the uh, any the road deck itself, the support structures, the secondary cables, all of that, uh, and of course any traffic load that it supports, all of that comes to an average of two kips per foot. So let's say that all comes two kips per foot. And then I'll also define the cable drape, the lowest point on the cable drape. And uh, from a horizontal line, Let's just say that that is a 15 foot cable drape. So uh, all of this is given and I want to find the maximum tension in the cable. So again, we have a simple suspension bridge model here. Um, the, I don't know how tall these would actually be or uh, is something we, we could look at and debate and consider, but for now, uh, all that we really need to be looking at is the cable drape. So we have two simple suspension bridge towers, a cable is being draped between them. We're ignoring the cables that are, that would obviously be going to the sides here to provide balance to the towers. But, um, so we have a parabolic cable droop with a maximum uh, drape distance of 15 feet at mid span. So I want to find the max cable tension. And from our previous discussions um, here, we can see that the max cable tension is probably going to occur right at the supports where the cables are steepest. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. So solution here. All right, so what I wanna do is I want to first find, okay, so going back to our primary relationship, H times HZ is equal to MZ. And MZ again is the uh, moment that would be generated at a uh, an equivalently loaded, equivalent length, uh, simply supported span. So, in other words, if we have a, imagine we had a hundred foot long, simply supported beam. So let's first find MZ. So imagine we had a hundred foot long simply supported beam. And let's say uh, it's loaded with two kips per foot with a length of a hundred feet. Okay. And I want to look just directly at the center. So I'm going to be, I'm going to, for, to find the thrust, I'm first going to look just right at the cable center. Where, and again, at that location, I know the cable tension is going to be exactly equal to the uh, horizontal thrust. So MZ, well, this is a simply supported beam uh, with uh, uniform loading. I know the maximum moment on that from statics is just WL squared over eight. 
So that is two kips per foot times 100 feet, quantity squared divided by eight. And if I uh, map that correctly, I get a moment of 2,500 kip feet. So our MZ is 2,500 kip feet. And then uh, we'll need to find the thrust from that. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's take a look at that. We now have our, uh, our again, MZ at our center is the at the center point of our span, that is the maximum moment that a uh, simply supported beam with the same loading and the same length would have. So we now have our MZ. Right. Uh, now let's find our uh, horizontal cable thrust. And uh, let's see. So we can say that because we know that H times HZ is equal to MZ, H therefore, the horizontal cable thrust, must be equal to uh, MZ over HZ. In other words, at a given location, the uh, equivalent simple span moment are 2,500 kip feet divided by the drape at that location, in this case, 15 feet. So that would be 2,500 kip feet. Uh, 2,500 kip feet divided by our cable drape of 15 feet. And I get a horizontal uh, thrust, H. Um, H is then equal to 166.7 uh, kips. So, again, what this means is that if I have my cable and I cut it at bit span, I'll reveal a horizontal force or a thrust of H is 166.7 kips. And then in turn, at the support, I would also need that same uh, 166.7. And then, although at the end, I would have some vertical component as well, and that would be balanced by, that would be brought into equilibrium by all of the other um, distributed loads that would be carried by the cable. However, all of those distributed loads are vertical, and so I know just from uh, horizontal equilibrium that this H is going to be equal to this H. In other words, we'll, we'll, we will, oh, the horizontal component of the tension is a constant across the entire cable. Okay. So now what I want to do next is I want, so I, I wasn't just asking for the, uh, cap, the horizontal cable thrust. I wanted to know the location and the magnitude of the maximum tension. Now um, to do this, what I really need is I need the slope of the cable at the end point, because uh, we can see that this cable is going to become continually steeper and reach a maximum steepness right at the supports. So therefore, if I want to know the uh, maximum tension, I need to know the actual slope of the cable at its supports. So let's go ahead and do that. And I need to apply a little bit of geometry, a little bit of trigonometry to do that, but it's not too bad. So let's say I have a, um, per, a cable and let's just treat, and again, we were told it was a parabola. And I'm going to use the following coordinate system. I'm going to put the bottom of this cable at the origin. So let's say that's zero comma zero. And let's put this other one here, the right support, at 50 feet comma 15 feet. And then our other support at negative 50 feet comma 15 feet, like so. Now. Um, I know from, um, from pre-cal and from other geometry and uh, algebra material that there is a form for the equation of a parabola. 
that is symmetric about the y-axis. So the form of a parabola that is symmetric about the y-axis, in other words, one where the, uh, where the y-axis is the axis of symmetry, Well, this is of the form uh, y equals 4hx squared uh, divided by l squared, where you have a parabola like this, um, where the distance, vertical distance, is defined by h, and the horizontal distance by l, or in other words, l over 2, like so. Each half is l over 2. So this is something you can drive uh, with a little calculus or you can find in a reference. I found it in a reference and that's what I've been using. And so for us, um, in our case, H is going to be 15 feet and L is 100 feet. So that means that Y is equal to uh, 4 times 15 uh, X squared over 100 squared. Or if you simplify that down, we have a parabola of y equals 0 0.006x squared. And we're going to use that to find the uh, equation of, or to find the maximum slope at the supports. So let's go ahead and get some room to do that. Other ways you Oh, okay, yes, thank you. The question is, what does x represent in this equation? Um, y and x represent the uh, x and y coordinates. So if I put in, um, and we can actually test this. So uh, if I put in 0, I get a y value of 0. If I put in a x value of 50, let's, do, let's try that. Let's double check that. 0 0.006 times uh, 50 squared. And indeed, I get 15. If I put in negative 50, I also get 15. Uh, we have our parabola. We're modeling our parabola as being um, symmetric about the y-axis. And so our vertex is down at the origin, and then we're modeling this uh, going up into the right and up into the left. Does that make sense? OK, excellent, good. OK, so we have the equation of our parabola. Now we can. Um, Use a little bit of calculus to find our slope. Just a little bit of calculus in the morning, not too bad. Nice friendly calculus, happy calculus. like happy trees. Anyway, so let's take a look here. Um, so I want to take the derivative of this with respect to x. So again, we have y equals 0 0.006 x squared. And so therefore, dy dx, our derivative with respect to x, that's a relatively trivial uh, derivative to get, so just apply our power rule, so that is 0.012x. And this tells us the slope of uh, our parabola at any given x location. So if I want to, let's say I want to find uh, the, uh, if I'm looking, uh, now again we've said that the maximum tension is going to occur uh, at the supports where the cable is steepest, the cable slope is steepest. So let us look at the supports. The supports correspond to, say, uh, x equals plus or minus 50. They are, again, x equals plus or minus 50. So, uh, yeah, so x equals plus or minus 50. So um, let's just use 50, because this is a symmetric problem. The, the slope will be the same on the left and the right-hand sides. So uh, let's look at x equals 50. Let's substitute that in. And if you do that, you get a dy over dx, a slope, equal to 0 0.6. So then we can apply a little trigonometry. Now, 
at uh, x equals 50 feet, right at the right hand support, we will have the same horizontal thrust um, as we have. And then we'll have a tension force in the cable. So we have some tension force and we have some the same hor and, and the horizontal component of that is going to be our H that we calculated previously, that 166.7 kips. Now, um, this then in turn is going to be uh, congruent with our slope triangle. And the slope triangle, let's see, we have a slope of 0 0.6. So that is, that represents a slope of 0 0.6 to 1. Or if you want to get the hypotenuse of that, that would be 0 0.6 squared plus 1 squared, or simply 1.17. Or 1.17. So we can use this, then using similar triangles, we can find our uh, cable tension. So just doing uh, T over H is equal to 1.17 over one. Um, so in turn, the tension is going to be 1.17 times the horizontal cable thrust at this location. And if you multiply that out, I got 194 kips. And that would be our maximum uh, tensile force in the cable. Okay, so questions on this. Hopefully that wasn't too bad. Again, what we did was we uh, found our uh, mid-span, uh, we found the equivalent moment for our simply, equivalent simply supported beam. Then based on the mid-span cable drape, we found our horizontal thrust. And then we, in turn, needed to find the uh, location and the magnitude of max tension. And we did that by looking at the supports of the cables. Um, and we got the slope by taking the derivative. And then we uh, uh, used some similar triangles to find our components. And we determined that our tension force maximum was 194 kips. Uh, any questions on this uh, problem? Okay, so hopefully not too bad. And uh, I could write a lot of variations of this problem. Um, there are a lot of different ways you could approach this. So um, for example, you might have a cable drape provided uh, or you could have something like, uh, let's say you had a certain amount of cable that you knew that you knew you had and, uh, or you had, a, you had a certain type of cable that the tension couldn't be exceeded with. And so you, you could calculate what kind of cable drape you can have or will need, um, what kind of uh, geometry you would need, et cetera. So uh, next, I want to look a bit at cable drape versus force. So I'm going to erase this. I do want to talk a bit about cable drape versus cable tension. Let's go ahead and clear the board for that. So again, we're going to look at, uh, I, want to, I want to explore some qualitative relationships between cable drape and uh, for the forces within cables. So let's consider that. So again, cable drape versus cable force.
So uh, when we are hanging a cable, there are many ways we can hang a cable, depending on the length, depending on the loads we need to support, depending on our cable properties, etc. So consider even between just two uh, fixed supports or two supports that we uh, have to have at, at their given locations. So let's say we have that. Now consider some different cable drapes you might have. So if you have a, a, for a shallow cable, you're going to have a, um, so you have a, uh, a, obviously a lower cable drape. So for a lower cable drape up here at the top, and at, and again, at mid-span, all of these, um, we have to think back to our core relationship, which is, um, again, that MZ is equal to H times HC. So, and again, the MZ is based on the equivalent simply supported uh, beam. And so if they were all carrying the same loads, each of these must have the same uh, MZ, uh, all of these would have the same MZ value because they have the same uh, length and they would be carrying the same equivalent loading. So this one would have lower cable drape and because of that, our HZ would be small. So in other words, a small HZ and that would require a large H. On this cable here, you'll have a greater cable drape, a large cable drape. So that in turn means a large HZ. And that in turn means a small H. So, um, in turn, that we can get a general relationship, again, that the longer the cable drape or the lower the cable drape, the lower your horizontal force, and in turn, the uh, lower your required uh, minimum tension that your cable has to have. So again, the, a, lower, a lower cable drape represents a, on average, typically a uh, smaller horizontal thrust force. However, um, that of course does have some downsides. So our cable drape, another way, another way of thinking about it is that we're trying to effectively generate an equivalent moment with that uh, horizontal uh, thrust, with that horizontal thrust. And so our drape is basically, is sort of, well, is roughly kind of, uh, I, I, I am very hesitant to say is exactly equal to, but it is at least analogous to a uh, moment arm in say like a beam. So a beam, for example, has, if you look at like an I-shaped section, it's going to have a certain moment arm between its major moment carrying elements. And uh, here we have the same kind of behavior where our cable drape effectively uh, produces a, has a moment arm, and that's effectively what is going on here with our equivalent uh, simply supported moment. So, and then, so that is one thing I wanted to keep in mind. Um, of course, there are downsides to having a, long, a very long cable drape. The only way we can have that very long cable drape is if you have a lot of vertical space. And if you are building, say, like a suspension bridge over water, if you want to have very, very low drooping cables, it, that would mean that you have to have uh, very, very, very tall supporting towers. Also, cable isn't free, and the more of it you have, the more you have to pay for. And also, uh, the more weight you have. So, uh, in our previous example, we treated the loading as constant, a constant linear loading across the uh, across the deck of a bridge. But in reality, uh, that isn't can never actually truly be the case because if nothing else, the weight of the cable will vary, and that this that problem becomes more acute as the cable becomes well droopier and droopier, for lack of a better word. Um, now, what about if you have a perfectly horizontal cable? Let's think about this. What about a perfectly horizontal cable? So, in other words, let's say our cable drape for a perfectly horizontal cable, our cable drape HZ 
would be equal to zero. Well, let's think about that. Mathematically, if a, and this is not shown perfectly horizontally, obviously, but if I were to have a true horizontal cable, the uh, cable drape would be zero. And because of that mathematically, you still would have to support the same MZ. And the only way that can happen if you have H effectively times zero, the only way you can get a finite number by uh, multiplying by zero, uh, H would have to be infinite. So in other words, the only way you can have a perfectly horizontal cable is if you have infinite tension in that cable. And so I don't care what you do to a cable, it's never going to be perfectly straight. I don't care how much tensile force you apply to it, there is always going to be some amount of drape in a cable. And, uh, and even if you don't put any load on it, because even if you have no load applied to it, it still will have its own self weight. And uh, again, the only way to carry a, uh, to have zero droop or, or zero drape in a cable is if the cable is perfectly horizontal. All right, so uh, I next want to look at a very special type of uh, cable shape, and that is the catenary curve. And I'm not gonna drive the equation for the catenary curve. It is a uh, very complex derivation that takes quite a long time and is, uh, I'll post a link to some uh, derivations of it if you're curious, but uh, I just want to discuss it here. In fact, I will get something for demonstration. So I have a simple cord here. And if I support this cord at two different locations, at some endpoints. Well, there's enough stiffness in this one that it's not going to be uh, perfect, but there is a single curve that, that, that a cord that has weight um, and is uniform will, care, will, uh, will end up um, uh, falling into or naturally settling into, and that is the catenary curve. Now, again, a, uh, a cord with a little less uh, rigidity would be better for this one. This is an old boot shoe lace, but um, it'd be better to have uh, something a little bit more flexible, but I also need to be visible on camera, so that's the tricky part. Anyway, um, so a, a cable will tend, uh, a cable when hung from two supports will uh, naturally fall into a shape known as a catenary curve. And uh, there are some special uh, aspects of that that I want to look at. So the catenary curve, again, it is the shape you get when you have a uniform cable uh, carrying really only its own self weight. This is the shape a cable uh, assumes. Again, you need a cable carrying only self weight. and is perfectly, uh, uh, truly has no uh, lateral resistance. So it's an ideal cable. So again, the derivation is complex, but uh, I know we'll post some links to it, but um, you effectively have, uh, there are a variety of different uh, catenary curves that can be produced depending on the characteristics of the cable, but the controlling parameter is something known as A. It's typically referred to as A. Um, so this is our characteristic parameter for a catenary. And this is equal to H divided by lambda, where H is our horizontal thrust. And lambda is our weight per unit length.
And after a long derivation, um, you, can, you can find that y, the equation for a catenary curve, is equal to a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. And again, it can be, this can be derived from a basic free body diagram of a catenary, and then um, working through the equations of equilibrium, and then uh, a whole bunch of calculus, and you can get this. And yes, it is a bit of an ugly equation. Anything with a hyperbolic cosine is, uh, you're probably not in for a fun time, but that's okay. So, um, and again, A is the characteristic term. And so what this means is that you will have, um, for a curve at different supports, or at fixed supports, depending on the characteristics of the cable, depending on its weight, depending on its length, you can have a variety of different catenary curves. Now, um, it was originally thought that, uh, that this was actually a, uh, that, that cables draped in parabolas, but it turns out later, uh, you know, in the, in, in the uh, 16th century, for example, people thought that they draped uh, from, by a perfect parabolas, but eventually we discovered in the 17th and 18th centuries that it is actually a special curve known as the catenary curve, which is slightly different. So, A again is the characteristic uh, parameter of the, of the catenary, and a high A, again, it is the ratio of the horizontal thrust to the self-weight, the weight per unit length. So, a high A, a, a large A value, it, you have a high tension a high tension relative to length, or relative to weight. Uh, to self-weight, a low A, you have the opposite, low tension, relative to cable weight. So, in other words, if you have a, a variety of different catenary curves, the A uh, is going to decrease uh, as you go down. Or, sorry, increase as you go down. This is, uh, uh, let's see, this is increasing A. So here you would have A equals, for example, A equals 0 0.5, A equals 1, A equals 2. The droopier the cable, the higher the A, even at the same uh, cable length. And again, that is a, uh, uh, our relationship here. So again, a, a high A is you have high tension relative to our self-weight. Um, all right, so there is that. Um, now... Why does the catenary curve uh, form? Well, I do want to mention that briefly and state that the reason a cable will enter into a single shape, the reason a catenary cable will enter into a single shape is really about uh, minimizing gravitational potential energy. So things like to lie in, in low energy states um, things naturally settle towards low energy states. That's kind of a, just a general characteristic of uh, physics and math and the universe and thermodynamics and all that good stuff. So consider something like a, like a, a catenary curve like this. Now, imagine grabbing this curve. So let's say it is supported like this. And imagine grabbing this curve and uh, this rope or whatever and physically pulling it down. And then maybe pulling it tight, for example, pull, pull it tight, uh, pull it taut. So then the cable would look more like this. Two more or less straight lines uh, right to our point. Now, I, I did this, so um, when I do that, within this section, I lower the cable, uh, lower than, catenary, than the catenary curve. Again, I have a, a cable that is simply drooping, uh, hanging in its natural shape, and I pull it downward at the center. When I do that, I lower the gravitational potential energy at the center 
But the only way I can do that is actually raising the cable over in the other locations. So to the, re to the left and to the right, though, of our center portion, I may succeed in lowering the gravitational potential energy of the center point, but here I have the cable actually higher than the catenary case. And same here. So the catenary shape is one that, uh, that produces a minimum overall gravitational potential energy. Uh, the minimum overall gravitational potential energy. And that is why uh, cables will hang this way in their, uh, just when uh, released and allowed to naturally settle in um, their uh, desired shape. And there are a couple of special properties with this that we will get to when we look at arches. Um, so we know that the entire cable in this kind of uh, ideal case, the entire cable is in pure tension under its own self weight. And so that means all of the forces are applied directly along the axis. And something very special happens with this shape if you take it and invert it. If you take it and invert it, you'll create an arch. And uh, the shape of the catenary, because uh, all of the tension is all the forces are direct tension. The reverse holds true in the case of a arch. Where we flip it over, we will have a shape that results in direct compression all the way along the length of the member uh, or the length of the arch. And that, because it is in direct, because the arch would then be in direct compression, that results in, a, in an arch that has the most efficient use of material um, of any other form. So if you want to know the, uh, an ideal shape for your arch, you can actually literally just hang a very flexible cable of the same dimensions as the arch you're looking for, and then um, watch how the cable drapes, find that shape, and then render that into something like a you know, piece of plywood or something, and that will give you really the ideal shape of an arch uh, for that uh, span length, uh, et cetera. All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Again, uh, today we looked at uh, finishing up uh, cables. We looked at how to apply the general form of a, the cable equation to find uh, the relationship between cable drape and horizontal thrust and in turn uh, the tension in a cable. And then we continued on looking at some general properties of cables and finally finished up by looking at uh, introducing catenary curves. So this concludes what I want to cover in the course uh, over uh, basic cables, an ideal cable design, and uh, in the next lectures we'll be moving on to arches. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. Uh, regardless, look forward to seeing y'all in the next lecture. Look, look forward to seeing y'all then, and as always, thank you.